Hi everyone um, and welcome to our first Tamani Community uh, Features demonstration. Uh, this is um, a bit of an experiment for us and, and really what we wanted to do was bring together um, users of Tamanu and people that might be considering using Tamanu uh, to show them uh, various new features and existing features and um, yeah, give a bit of a community uh, feel. The idea of these also is that these will be presented by members of that community, whether they're uh, project managers or um, users in country or IT leads from various countries showing off new features that have been built um, for them or by them. Um, I didn't want to be uh, the first um, cab off the rank myself, but I was left carrying the can this week uh, due to a very, very busy week um, in a number of countries due to obviously COVID outbreaks and uh, vaccine campaigns and booster campaigns all ramping up. But that's fine. Um, it's great to see a few familiar names and a few familiar faces uh, on the list. And uh, hopefully this is the last one of these uh, demonstrations that I do. I, I always worry that people are completely sick of hearing my voice. Um, also, whilst this is a Tamanu Community Features demo, um, we'll also obviously at different points touch on both Tapaya and MSupply, occasionally um, maybe even DHIS2, but we see um, these as being a single ecosystem where possible in the countries that we work in. Not that any country has to implement all of these um, parts of the, eco uh, of the ecosystem, but we see them as being very interconnected. So occasionally during these demos, we'll touch on Tupaya and M Supply as well. And I think today we're going to show a little bit of Tupaya um, to show you some of the new reporting tools that are available. Uh, we're going to crack into it. We've possibly overcooked the agenda for today. It's going to be a little bit full, but we'll learn as we go along, I hope, and um, get a feel for how much we can get through in a single session. We're not going to uh, let people come off mute unless we um, unless we allow them. So if you did want to uh, speak, um, please put your hand up. But um, the the preference is probably just to put your questions into the chat channel. We probably won't take any spoken questions until right at the end, just so that we don't get derailed. Um, not trying to um, shut down conversation or anything. And in fact, one of the things that we want to do is leave space at the end for that sort of chat. But again. I'm a little bit worried we've, we've filled up the agenda too much today and won't leave enough time. We'll see how we go. Uh, so today, uh, did I just skip a slide? No, I didn't. There you go. Today we're going uh, through the COVID-19 patient journey. We're going to show you scheduling and appointments. And at the end of each of these, we're going to have a mini features. These are things that don't really deserve their own demonstration. They're very small things just to point them out to existing users that might be new functionality that they haven't seen. So those are the three um, areas, but in particular focusing on a COVID-19 patient journey and scheduling and appointments today. Um, as I say, we'll see how we go. We're going to start all of them for those that aren't familiar with Tamanu to describe what is it. It's, it's a patient level electronic medical records uh, system that's designed um, really specifically for low resource or remote settings. It's, it's the idea of it is to be fully featured, but designed for the settings in which we work. Um, which is largely um, the Pacific and, and Asia. Um, not to say that it can't be used anywhere, of course, but that's just the areas that we focus on. And it's, it's built around five principles, and we don't believe that there's any other software that, um, that can credibly meet these five principles. One is that it's sync enabled, so it works seamlessly offline whenever the internet is down, and that's across both mobile and desktop. It's not a web-based system. We know that there's a lot of systems out there that are web-based that might have an offline data collection app, um, this is not that. It's, it's sync enabled wherever you're using it so that if you're working in uh, a hospital somewhere and they lose their internet connection to the outside world or it's really slow, users won't notice. It's a completely seamless experience. It's completely free and open source. That is the license is free and open source. Of course, there are always implementation costs um, involved with software, but those implementations don't have to be done by us. And I think that's the, that's the key point. It's, um, it's a global good. And if someone wants to take it and run with it and implement it, there are no licensing fees. There's no compulsory support and maintenance fees. We encourage countries that are using it to pay annual support and maintenance fees, but they're, um, but they're not compulsory. And, um, and we really do want it to be a, a global resource. If you like the software, but you don't like us, you should be able to use it. Is what we, what we generally say. 
Uh, it's desktop and mobile enabled out of the box. That is as soon as you turn it on, desktop and mobile are talking to each other. They don't have to be um, configured. Uh, you don't have to have third party integrations that you have to maintain. Um, the data is fully uh, encrypted at rest and in transit. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's probably more accurate to say that the data is, is highly secure um, and we're constantly reviewing our security features. Um, having data that's fully encrypted in transit doesn't really mean that much. It's, it's one feature of security, but there's a lot more that goes into it um, to, to make sure that the data is secure. Um, it can also be stored uh, both in country if, if you want to do a local deployment or on the cloud, you've got full flexibility with the way you do your deployments. Uh, and it's interoperable. So it's, um, it supports different um, clinical coding. So if you want to use ICD-10, if you want to use ICD-11 when it's sort of fully released, uh, SNOMED, CPT, you can, you can um, take one out and plug the new one in within minutes. It's, it's not hard coded with any of that. Um, and it also integrates with DHIS2 and M-Supply. We've just also um, gone live with our first integration using uh, HL7 Fire, which is with the system in Fiji. Um, so we've now got uh, a live API supporting the HL7 Fire standard, which is really cool and makes it really flexible. Um, and yeah. This is what that ecosystem looks like for those who haven't seen. This is a really grossly simplified version of what we build out and implement in countries. Um, but it's, it's slightly simplified for one thing, Tamanu uh, within a couple of weeks will um, be acting as a patient master index for M supply um, to search patient data from, which will be implemented in a couple of places quite quickly. So I'm on Nauru for one thing, um, but uh, yeah, some really exciting stuff on the way. That's what it all looks like. I probably won't go through this in too much detail because um, a lot of you have seen this many, many times, but happy to come back to this and work through it more slowly um, for any um, who would like. And this is what our overall architecture looks like. Again, I probably won't dwell on this. I'm really putting this in here in case we uh, share this presentation later. Um, but the overall architecture of um, Tamanu allows us to deploy that central server, as I say, in a cloud environment. Uh, we usually use AWS, or you can deploy it on bare metal uh, on site, so in country. Um, we then yeah can connect it via HL7 Fire or custom uh, APIs uh, to external services, whatever they might be. Um, the server that sits in the middle of desktop and the central server is a LAN server, and that is almost always deployed on site, although you can set that up on the web. So you can run it as a web-based service or, or software as a service if you like. We don't recommend that for sort of live deployments, but it's quite useful for people that are doing reporting or who might be working remotely to be able to access to Manu from anywhere in the world. Um, it's also one of only four EMRs included in the Digital Square Global Goods Guidebook, which we're um, quite proud of. Uh, it's also now ONC certified um, and beyond essential, our sales are a certified B Corp. And all of this is published online. We try to be transparent both about um, the software and the organisation. So you can look up, for example, the auditing process that we go through um, to become a B Corp. Um, you can look up our INC certification, um, all that sort of stuff. That is the boring stuff out of the way, um, depending on your perspective. Um, so I'm going to crack into uh, the demonstration and work through some workflows. Um, I won't be able to see the chat channel, but we've got a couple of project managers who are online and they will um, hopefully be able to um, bring it to my attention if anyone asks a uh, asks a question. Uh, so we're going to run firstly through a COVID-19 patient journey and we're going to use Angus Brayshaw uh, as our test patient. He's a male, he's four years old um, and we are going to yeah run through his experience. This is what the landing page looks like for Tamanu uh, mobile and it's important to note that you can register new patients on mobile and create them with unique IDs or you can search for existing patient records. The design is that every single patient on the system is searchable across every device and they're all synced um, across those devices. So patients can move between different facilities uh, quite seamlessly. Um, you can also turn off the ability to register a new patient on mobile. Uh, so we're gonna select Angus Brayshaw, who was a recently viewed patient. Um, and we're going to give him a COVID vaccine, which is often the first step. Now, 
Uh, Tamanu supports um, routine vaccinations as well as COVID-19. It gives you some decision support. So you can see um, here that Angus hasn't received any of those um, vaccines. He was too late. And if we try to give any of them, it'll refer us to the catch up schedule. Um, but depending on your um, routine schedule, uh, he may be eligible for some. You can see his tetanus booster there. There's the catch up schedule there. And what we're interested today is the campaign schedule. So you can host any um, vaccine campaign. You can also host a mass drug administration campaign. So for example, if you were doing an ivermectin uh, or an azithromycin mass drug administration campaign, um, including a multi-dose campaign, you could manage it using Tamanu Mobile. Um, if we try to give you a second dose, uh, it's giving us a warning that he hasn't received his first dose of the vaccine. Now, um, what you can't see here is that you can also support booster doses. Uh, you can give booster doses without giving the first two um, doses. So, for example, you might be getting a booster of Pfizer, but your first two doses were with AstraZeneca. Uh, we are going to give Angus um, a Pfizer. Now, these fields are all um, configurable, very, very basic fields. Um, but you can add to them, you can collect additional data um, if needs be. We're just collecting the very most basic data, submitting that, and Angus has now received his first dose of COVID-19. Um, this is being used currently uh, across a few countries. Tuvalu just went live with it this week, Nauru's using it, Samoa's been using it for their entire um, vaccine campaign, recorded over 200,000 doses given there, and, um, and it works really nicely. Uh, so that's his vaccine. Now let's pretend, um, I'll just show you how we sync data from that. Um, that's a manual sync, otherwise mobile will sync automatically in the background. Um, if it can find an internet connection, it will, um, it will sync every few minutes automatically. Uh, but Angus has come back. Let's pretend we're a few days later and Angus is now going to get a, um, a COVID-19 test. Okay, so he presents to a facility and he's going to get a swab test. Um, now we have a really highly configurable programs uh, area. This is to support all vertical programs. Um, and it looks a little bit messy at the moment because we support in this demonstration environment, all of the surveys across all of our different programs are in there. Um, when you are working in a live environment, it doesn't look anywhere near that messy often, or usually staff can only see one or two surveys that relate to them. Um, so we apologize for that. So we're just gonna fill in a COVID-19 sample collection form um, for Angus Brayshaw, and then we're going to do a, a uh, COVID-19 swab. The use case for this is that Angus has presented to a facility that is going to take a swab, and they're going to send that swab off to a laboratory. They don't know what laboratory it's going to go to. There are multiple laboratories in the country that this swab might get sent to. So they just wanna capture Angus's details and give Angus the ability to um, to then uh, get his result later. Um, now, these surveys are all, again, really configurable. What we've been enc uh, encouraging countries to do is to strip down these surveys to the absolute bare bones of what they need, but there's no limit to what you can ask. So um, we'll collect consent. Uh, we'll put in a contact phone number. Uh, you can enter a subdivision um, for where the patient has spent the most time in the last 14 days, select what facility they're from, their ethnicity, their residential address. I'm not going to answer every single question, but um, I'll answer a few. Have you conducted a rapid diagnostic test for this patient? No, we haven't, okay, um, but we, we could do and it would give us different instructions there. But in this case, uh, so if we answer yes there, it gives us more instructions of what to do with the rapid diagnostic test. In this case, we're going to say no. What is the purpose of sample collection? Let's say it's contact tracing. Go on to the next page. Have they had a recent admission? Let's say no. Do they have any medical problems? We'll say Angus has got asthma. Uh, are they a healthcare worker? No. Are they pregnant? No. Do they have symptoms? Let's say yes. Uh, they first got symptoms uh, yesterday. What were the symptoms? Okay, let's say they've got cough and fever. Have they had a COVID-19 vaccination? Now, this is not actually needed in a country where we're recording vaccinations in Tamanu. Um, this question is in there in case you're using it for COVID-19 testing, but not vaccinations. So we are going to answer yes. I won't enter in the rest of the details, but I'll, I'll enter it in now just for fun's sake. But um, 
but you don't have to you, you wouldn't answer that question in, in this case because we already know his his vaccination details uh is this patient at a higher risk of developing severe COVID 19 let's say no but does the patient have a primary contact who is at high risk we'll say no and then we'll submit that survey that goes through goes through and it appears uh just there now i've been playing around with angus earlier today obviously um, and you can see uh, there's, a, there's a few of those sample collection forms that have been submitted. So that goes off and that's now all the data that you would usually have been filling in on paper. We've now digitized it. So you don't need to fill in a paper record for Angus. Now we're just going to do the lab request. Okay, and the lab request is really simple. Uh, we go new request. It generates um, that lab request number automatically and that is a unique id for the lab request i'm going to just note it down um, and usually we would give that to the patient but um but i'm going to show you uh, in a second um, how the patient can use that to look up their own result uh, this is a screening test um, is the reason we're doing it is a specimen attached yes we do the date time that it was um, that it was taken and the lab request type now in our case we're going to enter COVID-19 and we're going to select from these options as for the type of test that it is but of course if you're doing a rat test you can just enter rat test enter the result immediately and the job is done the sample doesn't get sent off to the laboratory it's all just managed uh, here in the app which is quite um, quite useful but in our case the use case is they're getting a PCR test let's say it's a nasopharyngeal swab Okay, and that's going to be sent off um, through the lab. So you can see it's sinking there. Okay, now we could sit around and wait a few minutes for that to sink um, periodically, but we're just going to force that sink with a manual sink. All done. We come back here, and you can see that it's synced. Now, how much data can you build up before you sink? massive amounts of data. You could work for weeks at a time in theory um, if you wanted to um, before you synced your data. Obviously for this use case that would be problematic because the data has to arrive at the laboratories for them to um, for them to actually do the test. What is typical though is that sometimes the mobile devices lose connectivity for a few hours, um, maybe even for the whole day. But when they find internet, internet connectivity at the end of the day or when they come back into range, um, all of the data that they've collected will sync back and forth. Um, we've optimized sync to the point now that um, in Fiji, for example, there's about 600,000 patients on the system. And if you've got a good internet connection, you can sync them in well under five minutes, all 600,000 patients. Um, uh, but if you're talking, you know, a day's worth of work, it's, it's very, very fast um, still to sync it. So that's the workflows on mobile for the COVID-19 um, patient journey. There's, there's a ton of other stuff that we could go through. We're not going to go through it today um, for obvious uh time reasons now we're going to uh, mentally transfer to the lab let's go to share my screen here okay let's just log back in um okay so uh, we come into here, uh, I'm going to do what we call an Easter egg and just make sure that's uh, synced. Okay, um, this is Tamanu Desktop. This is what the labs are using to enter the results from their, um, uh, from their work. And we're going to see here all the lab requests that are coming in. Now in Fiji, this has been used to, um, to process over 60,000 tests. Um, we don't have anywhere near that number in the um, in the demo environment, but you can see here, these are the three tests that have been requested for Angus Brayshaw. Now, um, you may, of course, once you've got 600,000 patients, not want to search by their surname. You may want to um, search by that request ID, and that's typically what the countries do because they get the sample, um, it's got the swab in there, and what they've written on that is the um, is the sample ID. They have written the patient's name usually, but it's far faster to search with the um, with the patient ID, which I think is that. Sorry, with the sample ID, and that comes up there. That brings up the one that we just entered. I'm going to click into it, okay, and we can now enter the results of that uh, of that lab request. So it was a nasopharyngeal swab. 
We can set our laboratory. If, again, if there are multiple laboratories in the country, we'll say this is being done at CWM Hospital, Fiji, obviously. We're going to enter the result. We'll say poor old Angus is positive. You can say what the test method was. You can say the laboratory officer. You can put in your verification data uh, if you like. We'll say that this was a 25. Um, the time that it was done. Ah. Okay. Confirm that. And all of that's there. And then we're going to change the status of that from reception pending to published. Now the laboratory can use this for each of the steps um, in their laboratory workflow, but we're just going to jump straight to published and save it. And you can see now that, that log, that's been logged there, who's done it. That's my username in this system. Um, and you can see that poor old Angus is positive. So what do we do with that? Typically in the lab, they don't do anything. That will then go off to one of the public health teams. The public health team can then search uh, the lab request table and find all of the ones with a published result. Okay, come in, find the positive results and contact the patient. So we're going to go back and look at Angus now. Um, okay, if we open up, so this comes back to the patient encounter where that was created. So we can see his laboratory um, test there that's now been um, published. If we go into the programs area, we can also see the surveys that were collected for him. Okay, again, I was mucking around earlier with Angus, so that's why there's two surveys for today. Um, but you can see here, those are the answers that we entered into the survey before. So if you want to populate your contact tracing system, your data is right there, or you can do your contact tracing straight from here. Um, you, you have all the details there, you know their risk stratification from that, and you can start interacting with the patient. Of course, in most countries at the moment, um, active contact tracing is not um, you know, taking place once the, once the outbreak gets to a certain point, but what a lot of countries are doing is doing risk stratification. So if they're at higher risk um, here, um, you can contact the, um, the patient and, uh, and get in touch with them. In this case, um, Angus has gotten very sick. Okay, so we're going to admit him into hospital, and this can be hospital in the home, uh, or it can be um, physically. So we're going to say that he's at home, but he's been considered hospital at the home. So the practitioner is Megan Lane, and say that his reason for encounter is COVID nineteen. Okay, so he's now got this admission and we can now start to deal with Angus Brayshaw as an active COVID-19 patient. Um, now, uh, I'll show you what that looks like. Here. Oh, so we've got to add the diagnosis to bring him in as an active COVID-19 patient. So we'll say that he's virus identified. That's a confirmed case. That's the primary diagnosis and we'll do that. Now that will automatically code for ICD-10. All of the diagnoses in here will code for ICD-10 by default. You can change that and choose another coding system though, okay? But we've now said that he's a COVID-19 patient, he's admitted and he therefore automatically comes onto our uh, active COVID-19 patients table. And you can see him just there, Angus Brayshaw. We, we haven't given him a clinical status, but we do know when his admission started, okay? So again, we can navigate to see Angus from here by clicking there, go into his admission. And one thing that a lot of countries uh, would like to do is monitor, if not every day, at least periodically, um, what patients are, are like. So we can go into this program section and enter a new survey against Angus. I should also stress that I'm racing through all this. This is not intended to be a training session. We obviously don't expect anyone to know how to do any of this, um, you know, without further training. This is really just showing you the functionality that's available. So I apologize for rushing uh, a little bit, but um, uh, as I say, just trying to get through everything. So um, we choose COVID-19 and we're going to do a COVID-19 patient survey. Now this is designed as just a really basic, simple survey of, um, of when uh, a staff member contacts Angus, he's at home, um, he's considered hospital in the home, he's isolating, um, and we would just want to touch base with him and see how he's going. Are you experiencing any of the following symptoms? We're going to leave that blank. Have you had any contact with a person who is not in isolation? We're going to say no. And the clinical status of that patient, 
we're going to say low risk. Now, again, you can add as many questions to this daily survey as you like, but you probably want to keep it fairly simple. And then we complete that response. When we come back into here and we look at the active COVID-19 patients table, we can now see that Angus has been stratified as low risk. You can also see when his last survey was completed, okay, so that you can then find patients that haven't been assessed in a while. One way to search this, of course, is to come to the clinical status and just say, look, I just want to see patients that are critical. There's one of them, Carla Tolson, okay, coming to here and look at her. And you can go into that admission and do lots of other things. You can do additional lab requests. You could do imaging if you wanted to do chest x-rays. Um, lots of functionality that we can run through at another time. But, um, but you can see the last program survey that was submitted there. Um, We'll do a new one just to update that because I've spoken to Carla and realized that actually her symptoms have abated. She's actually feeling much better now. Um, so she's asymptomatic. Uh, she's still experiencing a sore throat. We'll say that's actually symptomatic. Have you had any contact with a person? No. I'm going to change her clinical status to needs review. Okay. And complete it. So she's no longer critical, but she does need review. And so when we search these patients tomorrow, if we're limited for time, we can just go straight to the ones that need review and hopefully Carla will be discharged um, from isolation soon. So that's the patient journey for, um, for COVID-19 patients. I want to um, very, very quickly show you some of the reporting that we can attach to that. Um, you can export line list reports out of Tamanu and they'll export into um, Excel. We'll go through them yeah, in another presentation because it's a whole sort of module of Tamanu. Um, but if I share my screen now and just show you some of the reporting. Um, this is around vaccinations. Um, Samoa has been using Tamanu since the start of their um, campaign um, to track their COVID-19 um, uh, program, the COVID-19 vaccine program and you can see here all of the reporting for the country is um, is built in so this is national level reporting you can then go and set this map for example to show me uh, percentage of the eligible population vaccinated by village and this will give me a heat map of every village in Samoa and the vaccination status for both first dose oh, uh, for both first dose and second dose. You can see that there's still a few villages that need to be caught up on their second dose. You can also do that by district, for example, and that allows you to work out the districts in the most need. Now, what you can also do in Samoa, which is, which is quite amazing, um, and as you can see, by selecting that district, it automatically updates all of my visualizations over here um, on, the, um, on the right. Um, I can also even do um, the household vaccination status. Now I can't zoom in on this because this is live data, um, but this is going to show you every household in that district um, where they're unvaccinated. If I was to zoom in, it would take me right on top of the house, um, which is why I can't zoom in. Um, now there's not many people at the Ministry of Health that has access to that data, but those that do can use it for really, really targeted mop-up campaigns um, to go and find patients that are, um, that are unvaccinated. The other thing is that for all of our visualizations, uh, in Tupaya, um, you can export them as tabular data. So for example, this might be interesting to me as a color map, but what I really want is the, um, oops, is the tabular data um, that sits behind that visualization. So I can click up here and go and get that um, and, and show me the, uh, yeah, the tabulated data and then download that to Excel. Um, which is now doing to my computer, which I know you can't see, but, uh, but it is. Um, you can also do that at, at any level of the system. So if I come up to Samoa and I show uh, percentage of eligible population by district that have received their second dose, all of those then get tabulated, which you can see here. Um, for all of these visualizations over on the right, um, you can also set your time frame. So say you're only interested in the period from um, July to October, uh, July to December last year. You can set your date range, get what you like, whether it's for a presentation or whatever. Okay, so that's the second six months of last year. 
that'll update that visualization now to show you how that went. This is first dose. You can see while they trailed off, they switched to second dose um, at this point after a very successful campaign. Once you're happy with that, I can look at the tabular data for that, or I can switch back to the table data. And once I'm happy, I can download that as an image file or as an Excel file. And there's some advanced options around what that looks like. Um, so all of your reporting there is, is built in. Now I'm going to throw briefly to, um, to Georgia to show you a few new visualizations we've built around um, uh, COVID surveillance. I'll stop sharing. Um, and hopefully we've still got Georgia on the line. Hello, yes, still on the line. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, hi everyone, for all those that I haven't met. Um, my name is Georgia and I'm a project manager that's been working with um, Tonga a bit recently. Um, Mike, are you guys able to see my screen, the Tupaya? Uh, yep. yep, yep, absolutely. Great. Um, so what we've been doing in Tonga is uh, they've recently had uh, an outbreak from, I think they had their first case in this um, outbreak from the 1st of February. Um, so we've quickly put together these dashboards for them. Um, so in here, this is part of their fun of what's called their Fun of Fun Ola project. Uh, and in here, you can see all of the different dashboards that they have. And so we've just built a um, COVID-19 specific one for them. Uh, so they can click on this and they can um, see here the cumulative cases that they have, um, the total tests that they've done, and their active versus their recovered cases. Um, as well as here, they have their um, epi curve and their data is being put in on a daily basis. Um, so they're entering that um, on a daily basis. And so you can see um, yesterday was the last data that they put in. Uh, and that's just in line with the way that their um, workflows are working in terms of their reporting. Uh, we have here as well our cumulative um, number of cases. Uh, and this is a pretty nice, this is one of my favourites personally, um, is their positivity rate um, graph. So you can see here um, the number of PCR um, tests that they've been doing and rapid antigen tests, uh, as well as their positivity rate and their target line. Um, so you, if you wanted to say just see their PCR, um, you can click on just the PCR and it'll um, pull up all of those ones. Uh, if you wanted to see just the testing without any of the other um, lines in there, you can just look at all of their tests that they've done um, since the beginning of February. Or um, similarly, if you just wanna see the positivity rate, you can click on that and just see that line um, pop up on the graph. Um, so that's quite cool and um, interactive and helpful. Uh, and then we've also just got a basic pie as well for um, our rapid antigen versus PCR, just so you can see the general breakdown of what kind of testing is being done. Um, so the other thing with this is that they're actually using it um, at the minister and CEO level, which is really helpful for them in terms of um, reporting at their press conferences uh, on a regular basis. Um, and yeah, they're able to just pop it up on their phones and have a look at um, all of the data that's coming through. Uh, what we also have, um, which Mike kind of showed for Samoa, is um, we have here is our map overlays. Um, so this one that I'm on is our number of confirmed cases. So uh, you can actually see where the outbreak hotspots are and where it's happening. So this is being mapped at the village level in Tonga. Uh, so in here in town, you can see there's quite a few um, in Kolofa'o and Malfanga. Uh, and then over here, you can see we've got another hotspot that's popped up here. Um, and that's in Toli Toli, and that's actually um, the prison. So you can see um, yeah, where all of the cases are sort of coming through and most of them. Um, we also have uh, a map overlays for um, this number of swabs that are um, being conducted uh, in here. It might be a little bit messy, um, but this is so that they can see, make sure that they're swabbing in the right places um, and that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that is pretty cool uh, is we can do a double map overlay. Um, I don't want to get too technical um, with it all, but if you wanted to see, say, um, the total number of swabs by radius and you also wanted to see your confirmed cases, um, so you can see, for example, that there's a, a big circle for um, a lot of swabs being done and it's dark red because there's quite a few confirmed cases in there. Um, but, yeah, that's just fun to play around with as well. Um, yeah, so that's the general overview for the um, Tonga dashboards that they're using uh, for their COVID outbreak. Uh, thanks, Georgia. That's amazing. There, um, yeah, there's some really cool stuff there that um, that 
uh, Tonga is using, and it's worth pointing out that Tonga is not using Tamanu to generate those. That's all being done through Tobias. So that's what I um, was saying at the start. You don't need to implement the entire sort of ecosystem to get um, to get some of the benefits. I'll very very quickly show you this. We had a, um, a private question come through. Can you just use it for booster campaigns? Absolutely. Um, I didn't run through that in the Tamanu functionality, but I can show you that Nauru is just using Tamanu now for booster campaigns. We have imported all of their legacy data, um, but they wanted to monitor their booster campaigns. Nauru has done an absolutely terrific job with vaccinations. Here you can see um, a heat map of coverage um, by district um, for first dose, for second dose, and now they're trying to do targeted campaigns for their booster dose. Um, and you can see here, um, how that's going. Again, you get all these visualizations here and this can do all your disaggregation for you. So for example, um, disaggregation by age, um, and you may want to only say, I just want to see the Pfizer booster, how we're traveling there. Um, or you might want to see everything. Uh, for some reason, you might just want to go back and see your AZ um, doses or whatever the case may be. Um, so all of your disaggregation is done for you. And then if you click on a particular district, whatever that might be, all of those visualizations over on the right will automatically um, update once it pulls through the data. So you don't have to sit there analyzing your data and going through spreadsheets endlessly. Um, it's, uh, it's all automated for you. Um, okay, that's probably enough about COVID. I think we're all sick of hearing about it anyway. Um, I wanted to now um, <laughs> quickly show you uh, our appointments and scheduling, um, and then run through a few sort of very new features. Now, one of the things to remember with Tamanu is that it's built for simplicity. It doesn't perhaps have all of the bells and whistles, um, you know, of, of some systems that would cost millions of dollars to implement. We've tried to build it with all of the features that uh, the settings that we work in would need, but nothing that they don't need. And we've tried to build um, uh, scheduling and appointments around that. So we're just going to look at the appointments um, feature today and have a look at how some of that works. Um, here's our appointments calendar. You can see um, here there's three uh, spaces that we've booked. You can book in by location, by clinician and by appointment type. So a typical thing might be a diabetes clinic. Um, you might be booking people in for a TB screening or, um, or cervical cancer screening clinic, whatever the case may be. Um, you can you can uh, book them in and see them on this table. So I'm just going to work through the workflow before I show you the rest of the features. So we're going to do a new appointment. We'll do it for poor old Angus, been a bit sick recently. And we're just going to say that this is a standard appointment type. Now you can, the appointment types are configurable. So you can have dozens of different appointment types and you can then search by appointment type. So as I say, you might have diabetes clinic, cervical cancer screening, whatever the case may be. We've just built in these, these random ones. But let's say that it's a, it's a standard appointment. Um, the start time, uh, let's say it's going to be at 11.40 a.m. Let's make it 12.40 p.m. Okay. The clinician, let's say it's Megan Lane. And the location, we'll say it's clinical treatment room two. Again, all configurable. And we're going to schedule that appointment. Um, and you can see that he gets slotted in to here. Now, if I come along and I'm a clinician, I'm not really interested in seeing all of the appointments um, for today. It's interesting, and this is a nice table to show how busy we are, but I just want to see uh, appointments for clinical treatment room two. Okay, so I can set it so that I'm just looking at clinical treatment room two. Yeah, oh, okay, that's interesting. Or if I'm a clinician, I might want to view it by clinician. Okay, so you can see all of the clinicians here now as the column headers. And I'm Megan Lane, and I just want to see what my appointments are for today. So I can go Megan Lane, and there they are there. I can also um, sort by appointment type. So again, these are just our standard ones. If I just want to see the standard appointments, I can sort like that. Okay. Um, so I found what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for clinic treatment room two. Okay, look at how we're going. Maggie Smith has arrived. Jennifer Smith has cancelled. Uh, it's now 11.40. Trish Lane should have arrived. I'm going to click on her appointment. Okay, and I can mark that she has arrived. 
So if we come back and view by locations, you can now see that the clinic treatment room two, that Trish Lane has arrived. Angus Brayshaw though, he has called us and he wants to reschedule. Okay, so he's not going to be available today. I can come into here. I can reschedule that for tomorrow. Okay. Everything else is the same. The clinicians the same. The locations the same. I'm going to update the appointment so that when I go through to tomorrow, I should see him there. And there he is, there, Angus Brayshaw, 12:40 p.m. A bit more quiet on a um, on a Saturday. So that's the that's the appointments one in our product pipeline is to do patient notifications. Um, we can already email patients um, with certain details, uh, including um, the vaccination certificates or the COVID-19 test certificates. Um, the next thing to build out is uh, appointment notifications. It's a little bit tricky in the Pacific because a lot of patients don't have an email address and for a lot of them, their mobile phone number um, chops and changes. But what we will probably implement first is um, SMS notification, um, at least the day before, um, to and to whatever mobile address, uh, mobile number that we that we have for them. It's also reminded me that there's a quick thing that I skipped before, um, which is how does Angus find out what his test result was? Um, so before we came back in and um, Angus Brayshaw got a PCR test, but he then wandered away. How does he find out what his result is? We can email his COVID-19 test certificate to him, but that's a bit of a clunky way to do it for um, if Angus doesn't need the certificate or if he doesn't have an email address. So what we've built um, are these online widgets. So um, Angus is given his, um, his unique lab request ID, which he takes away with him. And he can come into this widget at a later date. It's also got a QR code on it, which allows you to link to it really easily and enter in here. Now, this is the live widget from Fiji. So this is a fake patient that we use. Um, uh, not a real result, but, but this is coming out of the live database. And you can see that this patient is negative. Um, that has been accessed over 60,000 times now in Fiji. And every single time someone accesses this website to look up the COVID-19 test result, that is one less person that has to call the National Call Centre um, and, and get their result over the phone, which was becoming extremely time consuming. Um, but we have these widgets set up uh, in multiple uh, places. So um, in Kiribati, in Palau, in Fiji, uh, I believe some more is now set up and ready to go. Um, and they're all the same. Um, so they are, they are searching for those COVID-19 test results like that. Um, the final couple of pieces of functionality to, um, to show you, I'll share my screen again, um, are what we call the, um, yeah, just the rapid uh, demonstrations. These don't deserve their own sort of presentation, but just interesting things for current users to see what have, has changed. So we've now got a toggle that you can search, uh, you can do an exact search by ID. So um, for example, um, if I turn that off and do WJWT, that will return to me Angus Brayshaw, okay? It will search for any um, NHN or NHN can be a different name, can be UID or can be patient ID or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but that patient's ID, it will do a partial search and it will find uh, anyone that's got WJWT. But um, in some places that doesn't um, work. Palau, for example, um, have sequential ID. So if you type in, there are patients in Palau where their ID is 39. Um, and they've been allocated sequentially. When you type for 39, you literally get thousands of results returned and you don't necessarily want that. So now I've toggled it onto an exact search by ID. If I search now, it won't find anything because there is no exact patient ID that has that. So if I type out the rest of it and search, that will search for an exact thing. And the users get the choice. You just toggle it on and toggle it off um, for the way in which you want to um, the way in which you want to search. Some of you might not also have seen that you can um, you can now search with a date of birth. You can search for an exact date of birth, or you can put in a range um, if the patient's not exactly sure um, what the date of birth is. 
Uh, the second thing to show you is that the facility and ID, uh, the facility and version number are now displayed down here. They're actually going to end up down here at the bottom of the screen, um, but they're a little bit in the way here. But um, we, this, this is really just to help with troubleshooting. Um, often patients aren't aware of what facility, uh, sorry, of what version they're running. Um, so now it will tell you. Um, Tamano will automatically update the desktop app um, when we run an update. So that's um, uh, not usually something that uh, users have to worry about, but when we're troubleshooting and we get a user that says it doesn't work, it helps for us to be able to really quickly say, well, what version are you running? Um, and they can now see that. It also shows them, shows them the health facility. This is obviously far less relevant if you're actually in the health facility. It's very unlikely you wouldn't know what facility you're in. But if you're connecting remotely, um, it often helps to know that you've connected to the correct facility um, because you, with Tamano, you have the ability to log in remotely. You can be at home, you can be uh, in hotel quarantine, you can be traveling, and you can log into a facility if you've got the right credentials. Um, and you want to make sure that you've logged into the correct facility. So you can now see um, where you logged into. And finally, discontinuing medication. Um, this is a new feature. Um, previously, when you discontinued, we're going to go into an admission for a guy called Peter Adams, who's currently admitted to hospital. Previously, when you discontinued a medication, it just disappeared, um, which was really, really unhelpful for clinical reasons. Um, so now, um, when it's discontinued, just like on a drug chart, it's crossed out but you can click into it you can see um, when it was discontinued um, who discontinued it and the reason that it was discontinued so in this case they changed the antibiotic you see they changed it to metronidazole and um, yeah they're also prescribed paracetamol in the next uh, community demonstrations we're going to go through the medications module comprehensively because you're now able to um, to include on your discharge, um, your discharge quantities, the number of repeats. Um, we're going to talk about our integration with M Supply, which is really exciting, um, and uh, and you'll be able to go back and look at um, uh, yeah patients' previous medication. You can see their most recent discharge medications up here, and again the integration with M Supply. Although this isn't um, going to be live probably by the next one, but um, it, M Supply will return dispense medications to to Tamanu. Um, that's all for the next uh, presentation. We are also going to go through NCD screening next month. Um, and yeah, as I said, talk about our M Supply integration and our HL7 Fire um, uh, API, which, which the M Supply integration will use. I'm going to stop talking. We've got a little bit of time left. Um, I don't think there's any need necessarily to run right up to time, but I'm just going to check in and see. Um, how that works. Oh, sorry, if there's any questions. Um, uh, a question from uh, Donna Wate. Hi, Donna. Um, can I use Tamanu for a new private telehealth project and do you have a payment feature? Uh, you can absolutely use it for a private project. As I say, it's, it's um, so long as it's being used in a low and middle income country, um, it's, it's free and open source. So if you just have a single facility and you just want to run it there, um, you can absolutely do that and, um, and we can even support you to, to get it up and running. Does it have a payment feature? It has an invoices feature. It's actually turned off in the demo environment, but um, that's maybe something that we can demonstrate next month. There's a few features still being built out with invoices. I'll put it on the list. Um, so you can put together invoices. Um, you can generate invoices for patients. It doesn't have um, the payment feature so it's not an accounting software you can't record payment but um but you can uh capture pricing itemization for each item and then generate an invoice when the patient's finished uh, their encounter which is which is quite cool um, you would then give the invoice to the patient they could pay um in another system uh, we're actually working on on an integration that we, we hope is live later this year where you can do that um you do the payment in m supply um so that they are encounter from Tamanu would be a line um, on, a, on an M supply invoice. M supply has got a really cool payments module that's already um, that's already built out. Um, but yeah, just yeah, get in touch and, um, and we, can, uh, we can go through it all. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining today. As I say, we're going to do this each month. I think we've run through all the questions there, but if you've got anything else, obviously get in touch. Um, if you wanted a more detailed demonstration or a presentation, of course, please just 
get in touch with us. But otherwise, uh, we'll see you next month and I'm going to go and get a glass of water. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks all.